Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Classroom Matters with your host, Christy Hool. Today, I am so excited to be sitting down with Dr. Deborah Peppers to talk about the dangers of teacher stress in today's demanding world of education. Dr. Peppers is one of only five teachers that was inducted into the National Teachers Hall of Fame upon her retirement from a St. Louis school district, and now she travels the world to motivate, inspire, and sprinkle (laughs) a little humor on every school and organization she speaks to. Hello, Dr. Peppers. Hi there, Miss Christie. Good to chat with you again. My tagline for my radio and TV is Dr. Peppers shaking the salt. So that's your <laughs> sprinkle in there. That's it. I know. I love yeah. it. I love it. I love it. I love it because your name is obviously super unique. And yeah. I'm sure that when you went to get your doctorate degree, yes. you probably thought about the end result. <laughs> I did. Of course, when you marry the name, you have to do something. And I didn't want to be Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band. So. <laughs> and there's only going to be so many people that get that reference. I know the oldies like me. <laughs> <laughs> So I really, you know, there's so many things that you've done in your life and your background. And, you know, I could go on and on and and on for days about your accomplishments and your teaching and your your rise from adversity in high school. And hopefully we get to touch on a little bit of that today as we talk. But I really want to focus on something that I'm really passionate about now. And I know a lot of educators are facing, and that is this epidemic of teacher stress oh to the goodness. point of where they don't even want to be in the profession anymore. I know. And unfortunately, it's usually the ones that are the best that really, you know, strive for not perfection, but for just, you know, consistency and wanting to do the right thing, touching all the students. They hate it when they have a child that fails or has the problems. And, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, sometimes people in there just for the paycheck make do and they get their tenure and they stay. And that's not good. We know that. Yeah. And I I was looking at some research because I was really curious about what the actual numbers were. And just a couple of years ago, the American Federation of Teachers put out a survey that they had done. And they listed that over 61% of educators find work to be stressful most of the time. And that was a couple of years ago. So I can't imagine what the numbers look like today. (sighs) But does that surprise you? You know, it doesn't because as I go into schools and I find all of this, we know just society in general has changed so much with the danger level and all of the paperwork and the details and, you know, the funding and the boards and it's just everything can be absolutely too much. And they don't really teach about this when you're in college, you know, you don't learn even student teaching. You don't really get in on all of that until you have it on your own. So when you were teaching, how long ago was it that you were actually in a classroom teaching? Um, The last time I was in the classroom was in the year 2000. It was the year after Columbine. And I was Mm -hmm. doing a radio show in St. Louis and the Columbine parents came into the studio. They were doing a tour around the country called tragedy to triumph, unfortunately. And that was kind of their hope too, is that they could reach teachers and what to do when you have, you know, the confrontation and the violence. That's the far end of the spectrum. But when I actually am talking with teachers, I'd say the paperwork is one of the worst things that today they're faced with, having to then try to couple that with the classroom discipline and management and Because I was trying, I was think I was kind of in the transition time when I was going, when we got into the, you know, situation with the schools and everything. And it seems like the drug issues are up more. We have the kids that just need counseling and the teacher has to put on a thousand different hats, as you know, and we need some super tools, but we don't seem to have them. But um, that's where we have to come in now and concentrate. And like you're doing right here, Christy, this is very important for teachers to hear and to know there are areas where they can go for help. Don't try to do it alone in the classroom by yourself. Yeah. And and like you said, I think both you and I realize that. But I I mean, I just think it's changed so yes. much. Um, you know, I have a, a young girl that is in my church and she's only been teaching. This is her very first year of teaching mm-hmm. in um, a, a school down in the city. And 
you know, when I see her on Sunday, she's just almost in tears, the yes. stress and the behaviors. And, yes. and like you said, the lack of what universities are helping teachers prepare for mm-hmm. before they walk in to the environment, because it is so much more today That's about right. the kid as a whole child and what, what kind of environment they come from. Yeah. Um, and the teachers are expected to kind of actually help raise the child. It's so true. We become parents, we become confidants, we become counselors, we become, you know, disciplinarians. And it, when you try to do all of that, you just kind of throw the lesson plan in there. And then you have the good children that are so compliant and quiet. And I call them chameleons. They're the ones that mm-hmm. you just don't even see, but you appreciate so much and you want to touch them and help them and get them some extension activities when others you have to deal with. But I think the best thing that we can do, and I know that even now the classroom that there was an old, um, oh, it was implemented for teachers, I'd say back in the early 90s, and it was Lee Cantor and assertive discipline. This was back when you were just learning what's the best discipline, how do you deal with this child? But it went from that to dealing with difficult parents. It went with dealing with, um, you know, violence prevention. And you can't prevent some of the situations and things that happen, but you can learn to manage and balance, I'd say, 90 to 95 percent of what goes on in the average classroom today. And there are some programs out there. My class was actually filmed for the uh, dealing with difficult students segments through Lee Cantor, and it's still available online. And five different teachers nationwide were used as role model examples in their classroom. I had helped start an alternative school at Lindbergh, and because we had to, you know, deal with kids that were dropping out, being kicked out, and I had some students that were 20, 21, and so you learn as you get older. It's kind of like, I guess, being in marriage. (laughs) You kind of learn the ins and the outs and the do's and the don'ts and the like you said though the worst part i think too is helping the teachers manage their stress level in the midst of all of this yeah and what are what do you think in your opinion and the experience that you've had that we as a society put on teachers that are causing some of this stress and health issues. That's right. I think one of the things is the high expectations. At least I would have phone calls from parents that would say, oh, she really likes you. Let me tell you, you can have her. I've had it up to my neck with her. You can just have her. And, you know, my thought is, she's your child. I don't want to have her. I've got 180 Mm -hmm. other students, you know, throughout the course of the day and then teaching and doing the plays and the musicals and But when you can get those children, those young people, when you can get them on your side, when you can get them to see that they're really important, that they they by themselves can make a difference in their own behavior, in their own actions, in their own issues. And that's where we have to then teach. And if we do that, at especially the beginning of the year to all of the students, you will still have, if you're consistent with your discipline and with dealing with your own struggles with balancing, at least 80 to 90% of what you will deal with during the day. And that leaves you that time to focus on, but please teachers do not internalize all of the stress and the things that are thrown on you, including, of course, dealing with the parents, having to conduct all of the, you know, parent conferences and, uh, oh, the extracurriculum activities. Many are still coaching and teaching and doing drama and music on the mm-hmm. side. And then we have to be on call to deal with the emergencies and, um, uh, You know, that's again, I'm in Florida right now and in our legislature right now pending is let's equip the teachers down here with guns. Can you imagine? No, I can't. I couldn't either. I'm just (laughs) thinking there is no way. So what they have done with the teachers association, they've at least compromised with the thought of only the ones that voluntarily would be the ones that already know how to carry and conceal and have, I think it's like 200 hours of extra teaching to be able to, Uh I mean, we're, 
instead of prevention, we're dealing on the aftermath and we have to address it up front more. And that's what I'm talking about. How do you feel about the social media causing high stress levels to <sighs> teachers? Because I think about like, okay, I get on and, you know, I, as I've mentioned, I am now a homeschool mom and, yes. and then just to stay a mom outside of school hours, but I get on Pinterest and I get on Facebook and I read these articles about these perfect things that are happening in these classrooms and homeschool rooms and, and, right. and in public school rooms. And I think, oh my goodness, I am just not even close no, to being at the level that some of these other people are. So, you know, like, do you think that that these social <laughs> media sites are putting a little bit of unrealistic expectations on our teachers? I do. And it's not just teachers, too. You can see, oh, we have the perfect little family at the perfect little dinner table. Here we are all with hands folded. Mom's <laughs> wearing her June Cleaver beaver. <laughs> <laughs> and in the meantime, my kids are throwing chicken back and forth across the table. And, <laughs> and that's why we have to be realistic about it, too. And I wish we had some, you know, the struggles in the classroom. One of the ones that they came in and, and filmed in my class that was used, I had a girl named Heather, and she was just obstinate. She didn't want to do her work. And they actually got right down there up close and how she was rolling her eyes and giving me the whatever and how I had to, you know, just really deal with that in a tiny little success way. The non-motivated students need to have one little inch of success. And if you can get them to just celebrate themselves instead of, you know, putting that level on them, and it's the same way with teachers. When we have had issues, and you know very well, especially having been in administration, you can see from one classroom to the next, it looks like, well, this teacher is doing so well. And, but you can take the same student that they may be having issues with, and another teacher down the hall thinks that they're just an ideal student. We just love it. can be the subject matter. It can be what's happening at home, um, you know, the situation with mom and dad and grandparents and the kids dealing with issues. It spills into the classroom. So I wish on the social media, we would have realistic classroom issues for teachers. Right. I was actually um, assigned to go down in, into the some of the city schools. We did a partnership with some of the bigger schools like Vashon and um, Sumner uh -huh. at the time and some of them. And I would be an observer from the background and take notes and, you know, videotape classroom issues. And then we would make public service announcements for teachers, we didn't show the issues, but we knew the issues. We talked about them. If it looks like, well, you're not doing a very good job if your children are participating and sitting in, you know, and it's not that way, you know that. So let's get real about it, huh? Yeah. And I, yes, <laughs> I, I mean, I think that's, that's the first thing that we need to start doing is one, stop. Yes. Well, we all, you know, getting real about it and also stop blaming the teachers Thank because you. if you work in any other profession, okay. Yes. And you know, my husband's an engineer. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and yeah, he does have clients and people on, you know, an occasional basis that give him a hard time and cause him stress. But when you think about teachers, they have the same 25 clients, we'll yes. call them or customers plus two more clients that are attached to that client or customer, That's aka right. the parents, yes. and they are dealing with them every day. They don't just deal with them once in a conference call and they go away. Right. They come back and then they come back and then they come back and then they come back for 180 some days a year. That's right. And you're not only expected to deal with the stress of dealing with kids and parents and humans on a daily basis, yeah. but you also have to deal with getting them to the next grade level, mastering all the essentials, yes. you know, making sure that they're, that they're uh, emotionally and socially ready. So it's a lot of things that we heap on teachers that I think sometimes, um, people that aren't in the profession really just don't understand. They don't. They don't understand it. They don't know about it. They just, you know, many of them are old school thinking, well, when I was in school, and even if it was only 20 years ago, you still are going through that thought process of if a teacher can't handle a situation, get them out of there. And you were alluding to the numbers of elementary teachers. I had six different classes, different preps, different, you know, groups. I taught theater, English, drama. Um, I taught radio announcing and, you know, several others in and out. And I would have upwards of 150 students per day 
for a semester and then it would change. And so I had 300 throughout the year. You know, we were in from a big school and I know you were too. And so when you think about all of this on the weight of teachers and unfortunately people that would have been a good teacher have teacher friends who hear this and they think, oh, I'm not going to do that. I'm not putting myself through that for the pay, for the, you know, so what we need to do, and of course, you know this, but many of the colleges and universities are now seeking, I taught in the master's program at Webster for teachers, MAT program there for 10 years. And we're trying to get the teachers to realistically understand this can happen, this can happen, here's how you deal with it. One of the big issues that I always stress to teachers is be consistent. If you have some rules that you're following in your classroom, don't give in and let up because the kids are being so good one day. No, if you're set that as a rule, it has to be the same for Susie as it is for the one that's having the issues or problems. And the other one is document everything, everything, Mm -hmm. everything, write it down, jot it down, go into detail later if you need to. But if an incident happens and you, you know, maybe it was something little to you, but then it gets blown out, the child says something, the parents are brought in, you have that documentation to share with your administrator. And of course, even if it goes to the Board of Education and some of my fellow colleagues have had to do that before with their job on the line and you just don't think about it when it seems so insignificant at the time. But those are the two main things that I would stress for young new teachers, be consistent and document everything. And the third one is when you leave your job, your work in the afternoon, you may have homework to grade, you may have supplies to get, but emotionally and mentally and spiritually, leave it in the classroom. You have to close the door on that, especially, you know, as you were going home to your own children and now as you're homeschooling, it's the very same thing. Yours is a 24 hour job. But it's hard for young new teachers to do that. Don't you remember staying at school for 12 to 15 hours a day? Oh, gosh. <laughs> and, and and try to tell a new teacher not to take it home with them or not no. to think about it. Because what, what a lot of people don't realize and about what you're saying right now is teachers, you know, and I know that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you, but teachers put a lot of it on themselves because they care so much about the kids right. and they're so passionate. You know, the reason that that some of these folks that work in these big organizations and work in a cubicle, you know, and yes. are working with with computers, they're not they're not taking it home as much That's right. and it's easier to shut off because they're not working with little human beings that they love yes. and they want to help make successful, right? I, I mean, know. I've never once heard my husband get off a conference call and talk about, you know, his computer <laughs> all night and any of the stuff that he did and how much he loves his computer and his oh, keyboard. But funny. because teachers teachers are working with children and we truly do and and you can say the same thing and right. being in a classroom is you you honestly love these little people yes. that you are taking care of. They're kind of part of who you are for that year. And so it is really hard for these young teachers to just say, "Okay, well, you know, it's five o'clock. I've done this much work. I'm going to shut it off and enjoy my family. It's almost impossible for them. It really is. That's why you have to consciously make an effort to do it. And one of the things we started at school that I thought was very helpful because I became one of the mentors for young new teachers. And I would actually videotape in the back of their classroom so that they could see themselves. And we would go over issues and things that would happen during the day. But we started an after school group called Stress Busters for teachers. This included the secretaries and uh, some of the administrators, even one of our custodians would sit in on it all faithfully. But it was, you know, talking about a couple of the issues, presenting them and getting, you know, solutions without having to go, you know, you hate to go to the administrator and you hate to have a staff of, Mm -hmm. you know, papers that you turn in and say, well, this happened and this happened because, you know, the good teachers aren't doing that. So if you can bounce things off of an older, more experienced teacher that you know is successful or has been in the elementary, it could be last year's teacher, or it could be, you know, maybe the music or one of the other teachers that only 
sees that child on a part-time basis. And of course, many schools now do have not only the counselors, but we had to add also because we were doing a documentary on troubled teens called Choices. And we had to actually add an intervention counselor because that's, you know, when the drugs and the alcohol hit a high peak and it's just so accepted today. And Anyway, so one of the things we did with Stress Busters, we, re- we actually told physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally ways to de-stress, to decompress, even if it was only for 15 minutes at the end of the day. And you'd be surprised being able to let someone else share an alternative to your situation. And then actually, you know, talking about it, we even, you know, after the school hours, you can even, if you're off campus especially, you can even pray with other teachers. And that just seems unheard of in this day and age. But boy, does it help. And so I would encourage teachers to do that, even if it's only a few of you getting together, two or three or four. And if you're doing those things, that leads me into my next question mm-hmm. to you, what you were just talking about. When you're looking at the adults in the building and how they how they come together as a team and, and de-stress and sort of be vulnerable with each other about things that they're struggling with in their job, that has to be a, a really tight culture and climate right in that building for those events to be able to happen. That's true. Absolutely. And sometimes it's just better to even find if you can find a mentor teacher, somebody that has, you know, had the experience and has the love for the kids, somebody that you would like to emulate to find them on your own and chat with them. I had a teacher, <clears throat> excuse me, Miss Alma, and she was kind of my role model. And when I had gone to her and talked to her, she was already retired. But she had dealt with me as a troubled teenager. I had been a runaway and dropout when I was 16. And Miss Alma welcomed me back. And she said, you do not compare yourself to other students. You have your own gifts, your own talents. And she put her arms around me right there in the classroom and shut the door. You can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. But she whispered in my ear and she said, Debbie, God has great plans for your life if you'll let him. And I'm here for you, too. And I watched that woman and she loved on those kids. I wrote one of my first articles was Chicken Soup for the Teacher Soul called Miss Alma. Mm -hmm. And they asked me to read that at her funeral. And of course, everybody was crying. But one of the things that she was consistent with, she would encourage the other students. Every single one that was at her funeral had a Miss Alma story about how she made a difference in their life. And that's what I wanted to do. It wasn't a pie in the sky. She didn't, you know, then just ooey gooey kumbaya. She set the bar high and she showed me where your gifts and talents are. That's where you can rise above and then work on the other ones. But she knew I was good in speech and drama and journalism and I became a teacher eventually of speech and drama and journalism, just like Miss Alma had been. And so I'm encouraging you to find somebody, one person. It might be a retired teacher. It might be a teacher in your school. Someone is a confidant. They may be in another school district, but somebody that's been in the classroom that you can pour your heart out to, lay the issues out and say, what would you do in this situation? What would you think about this? Where would you go for help? What's an extension I could get on, you know, who deals with these? Where could I get some extra help on this? And that's what I would suggest to all young new teachers. Have a backup ready. Have a backup. Yeah. Yeah. And and like you said, it may not be someone that's right there with you in the school. That's right. And and it's not always your spouse either. Right. Right. Because if your spouse isn't in education, they're not going to get it. They don't get it. (laughs) No, they absolutely don't get it. They think we get, oh, you get summers off. You're off at three Uh o'clock in the afternoon. (laughs) Oh, I don't know about you, but <laughs> what what summer did you ever get off as a Never, teacher? Never, ever, ever. Never. And I still don't. Never. Here I am retired from teaching and I'm still speaking and teaching. I did three hours of radio this morning right here in Florida. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I literally remember as a teacher booking and marking off in my summer calendar, mm-hmm. June through August, <laughs> one week. <laughs> <laughs> one week of actual not being at the school or being at professional development it's or being true. in a meeting or working it really like maybe one week. And I was lucky if I stuck to that and working on your own um, masters and then, you know, that's all of right. the other issues you have. 
You have to go so away from it, I think, to get a You do. Yeah. You do. But you mentioned the mentor, you know, talking to new teachers. So I want to throw this question at you. So if you're in a room and you've got a hundred teachers and all hundred of those teachers are first, second, third, you know, maybe they're even 10 in their 10th year of teaching, right. but they're all in that 61% of teachers yes. that come to work and feel stressed every day to the point of physical exhaustion and possibly physical health issues mm -hmm. and on the verge of getting out of the profession what would you say to them? One of the things that many schools have done as we're doing how to get parents on your side, a program that I have taught around the country, is to ask and get permission, get it even in writing by the school board or by the administration, to have a teacher's assistant, and I'm not talking necessarily for pay because we know the funding's short, but there are parents who would volunteer to come in and help you organize some of your things. They can, you know, you don't have them actually in your grade book, but they can even, you know, help with one of the kids' circles where they're doing, you know, a, a group activity. Or if you have this as an opportunity in your school, now, if that's not an opportunity, it may be another issue with trying to bond teachers together where you can kind of co-op for a couple of classes. I actually did a class within a class where we had 50% special needs students in one of my freshman grammar classes. And that was an absolute <laughs> nightmare for me. The special ed teacher loved it because it was, you know, kind of immersing the kids and getting them all together. But I wasn't used to that. So my hat goes out to special needs teachers as well. But you young teachers who are out there, and this is your first, second, third, or fourth year, I promise you it gets better. You will have other classes where during that year you think, wow, I have these 20, 25 students. I love them. They're great. I never want to let them go. They become my sweeties for the year in elementary school. And then the next year you may just have the opposite and think, what did I do wrong? So a good phrase for teachers is, this too shall pass, but what can I do right now to help me, to help in the classroom, to help with dealing with the parents? And that's what I would recommend. I don't know. What about where you were as an administrator? Would that have been something that would have been allowed? Yeah. And I think every administrator is different. Okay. Yeah. I know um, that too. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I definitely was open to those things and that those types of things did happen. We always welcomed parents in um, to get them on our side. And, and, you know, you talked about the prayer thing a little bit and I'm, I'm no, I'm not shy about talking about that. And um, I know that sometimes is a taboo subject, but um, you know, we would have parents come in during our lunch and they'd want to sit and eat lunch with their kids and they'd get their Bibles out. Mm. And I was a supporter of that. That's good. And I'm like, you know what? You're reading the Bible to your own child. That's and right. you know, I'm, I appreciate that. And maybe there's some others around the table that are just having our eavesdropping that might hear yeah. in on that too. And that's a good thing. That's good. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so, and that's just I totally one other agree with that advice. Yeah, that's the spiritual side. Physically, yeah, right. teachers, keep take care of yourself physically. Don't, you know, so many are going out for happy hour when school's out instead of going for a stress busters or a conference with other teachers or, you know, something physically. I know there are many teachers that just, <laughs> instead of they just go home, get drunk, and then go pass out and forget true. about it until, until the, the next, next day. morning. Yeah. And then come in with a hangover and let's see how you do it from that. And I know we're laughing, but, it, you know, in the high school oh, areas, you right. actually see that that's a right. lot. And another thing is take care of yourself physically. Uh, you know, I'm not going to preach about physical fitness, but I was 100 pounds overweight when I was 23 years old. And I joined Weight Watchers and I learned how to eat sensibly and healthy and I lost 100 pounds. But I see so many teachers just eating sugar and drinking caffeine all day. Because yeah, it's easy. It's easy. And it's there. And quick. <laughs> and it gives you That's a right. little adrenaline and rush. The teacher, <laughs> and the teacher's lounge is always full of donuts yes. and cookies and... Uh. Mm -hmm. Horrible. I know what you're talking okay, about. Okay, so that's one so, side yeah. of it. And the exercise, just, to, you know, whether you do, you know, your own physical exercises or go into the gym or yoga or whatever it is for you, we have to do something to keep that, that also de-stresses de and it takes your level of cortisol and your whole blood pressure down, you know, it really does. Yeah. It's just one yeah. aspect I, of it, but a balanced life a balanced everything in a balanced classroom. That's our goal. It's never fully, 
<laughs> arrived and achieved, but it's still the goal. And I, I, I think that is really great sound advice mm-hmm. for new teachers, especially those that are feeling stressed yes. um, in the now right now. And, you know, I think I would just maybe add to that, that you might not see the benefits and the rewards right now, yes. but I promise you, you will in the future. You will have kids come back uh, to that recognize you in public and, and you will get invited to graduations yes. and you will see these children and they will remember That's you. Right. And although you might have thought that you had this terrible year, you know, when I was first hired back in, oh gosh, 98, 90, mm-hmm. something like that, um, as my first teaching job, I was hired as an overflow teacher, oh. which was, uh, there were seven sections of a grade level and they had too many kids and they wow. needed to open up an eight section. Oh. And back in that day, guess what? The principal went to the teachers and said, Hey, pick a couple of kids yes. that you want to move out of your class. Oh, no. Well, you can only imagine the list I got. Oh, wow. And so in the moment I'm thinking, uh, I don't know if this is for me. Yeah. And you know, there were a couple of points in that year when it just, I was ready to, to give sure. it all up, but Absolutely. you know, a couple of years ago, I, I, I received notification from a couple of those students asking me to come to their high school graduation and that I was their favorite teacher of all of their career. And I'm thinking, are you serious? (laughs) I almost quit that year. But you will see rewards in the future because as long as you're giving it your best and you love the kids and you're doing your very best and you're, you know, you're teaching them what they need to know to make them successful to move forward, Mm -hmm. they're going to remember you and you're going to forget about the stress and it's just going to be a reward um, years down the road. And here's one too. So don't give up. Don't forget that when you're going into the hospital after you've been in an accident or you're on that stretcher, when that sheet is coming up over your eyes, you're looking up That's and right. there's one of your students. Oh no. <laughs> Hopefully one of your favorites that did well and went into medicine. But, you know, we're talking from, you know, the perspective of long term, but you're so right. First year teachers, don't give up. When you're a good teacher, you know it's a calling. You love the kids. You will be able to handle it. It takes practice. It's like learning to do anything, riding a bike or running machinery or only it's little human hearts. And if you, mine were big human hearts. I had some guys six, four and 300 pounds. So, but sometimes you give and that's what makes the difference. When you let them know, and it's cliche now, but kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. But it's so true. They want to know that you care about them, not just about teaching, not just about education, but about them. Celebrate every little success. Learn how to help them learn to balance. They're struggling in life, too. It's not about you. Most of the time when you have a child that acts out, it's not about you. It's something happening with them or at home or with, you know, not fitting in at school and This is your chance to make a difference and a mark into their lives. And one of the things I did as a Christian teacher, but not in a Christian school, when school was out, I would turn the light out and sit in several of the really difficult students' desks. And I would just say a prayer over them, over their family life, what they're dealing with, what they're going through. If I know it's drugs or alcohol or a divorce or, you know, even absent parents, whatever it is, I would just say a prayer for them. It not only helps them, but it helped to release it from my shoulders. And I I encourage teachers to do that. I'm not going to preach or proselytize, but that's just something I used as an extra tool that helped. Wow. That's, yeah, that's, I, I, I've never heard of that, but I think that that's an amazing way to just take it off yourself right? and to also has to ask for help for the kids yes. too. Um, so what do you have coming up this summer? What can we look forward uh, to uh, with Dr. Peppers well, coming up? I'm starting a podcast too, but mine's going to be more on a Christian basis. And I also have one of my former students has invited me on Mother's Day weekend to come up there. I'm speaking to, uh, it's open actually to the public coming up this next, uh, let's see, May the 11th. It's on a Saturday at Mm -hmm. 4 p.m. And so I've already heard from at least 100 of my former students and or parents that are going to be there in addition to their church that's going to be sponsoring it. And it's called Seed Planting. So that's what we do as teachers. And I'm, you know, traveling around doing a lot of the speaking and some we're getting ready to do a jungle trip down the Amazon in South America. (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, wow. We've been in 65 foreign countries and have loved going into schools and, you know, seeing the differences there and just teaching teachers to appreciate any place you go these days, they're having issues with the young people because we're a worldwide society now. And um, you can always get help on the internet, but you can also, like you said, find that perfect classroom that sets you back and don't look at those, look at the real ones that are helping you out. That's what I suggest. So we can find you at www.pepperseed.org. That's correct. Okay. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, um, any of those places? Well, let's see. I'm on Facebook. You can get me on there and see, you know, lots of fun pictures. And uh, we do have a couple of, but more personal things like that. So that's not as public, but I do put a link. We will have a link to my um, podcast once I get those going. If you want to get some good motivation and inspiration, you can do that as well. Well, I would love for uh, when you possibly this coming school year or or the next time you come in St. Louis after your May event um, to come by the studio, do another podcast with us. Yeah. I would absolutely love to have you on the show again. Good. You are just an absolute delight and a joy. And I'm, I'm just so honored well, you. that you have taken the time out to, to have this conversation. I think it's important for the listeners of this podcast to really hear what you have to say. Uh, it's so vital to what they're doing today. So thank you, well, thank Dr. Pepper. I was honored um, to be I truly invited. Appreciate God it. bless you. And I will definitely come back in anytime you want me to. And that wraps up this episode of Classroom Matters with me, your host, Christy Hool. I will see you next time. Bye.